Hey everyone, I am so excited to be with you all this afternoon to share a topic that is extremely emotional for people. And it's a topic that I posted about last week uh, about my friend and client's new business. Uh, and it's about really shifting the paradigm of these negative toxic belief systems that are attached to divorce, even just breakups. I mean, it doesn't just have to be divorce, but obviously divorce usually has some assets and some children involved and things like that. So I would like to first welcome, welcome you, my friend, Regina. Say hi to everyone. Thank you. I know, I'm so happy to be here. This is exciting. She was so spontaneous in doing this and just didn't even think about it. Was like, yes, and just showed up and I love it. Uh, so Regina and I have known each other for a really long time. Uh, one of my best friends since I was five and Regina went to high school together and um, then we all became friends during high school doing things together and then college and and then it went crazier she went to work uh, for my that's my right my dad had a law firm and he kind of read this woman Susan Turner to be a very successful attorney Right. And then Regina wound up working for Susan, who also my stepmom was the executive assistant for. So we have been intermingled throughout our lives. It's true. We really, when you think of it that way, because I even forgot about your stepmother. And Susan was my mentor, first out of law school for 10 years. And um, she was really a great example for how to approach divorce with empathy and kind of my model that got me thinking about all of this all those years ago. Yeah, well, that's so good to hear that I didn't realize Susan also impressioned that upon you. So, um, well, listen, before we tell everybody about what you're doing and why this is so important and how this is a movement and why I'm so freaking excited about it, just give everybody a little bit of backstory of, you know, you went to law school, you were a divorce attorney. How did you get here? Yeah, I um, went to law school, you know, straight out of college. And when I think about it, I ended up working at a small law firm um, in a small town as a divorce attorney because I had I felt like I wanted to help families even then. I felt like I could help them go through the divorce in a way that was going to leave their children in a better place at the end or an okay place. Um, and I did that for a really long time, for 17 years, but it became so frustrating when the system just isn't set up um, to help people through the emotional side of divorce and the lawyers look at it. I'd say to clients, this is a business transaction for the courts. So we're looking at this, as you said, just assets, liabilities and property and the emotional side of it and the human side of it gets lost. So after 17 years of that, um, to back up a few years before that, my son, um, my oldest son was diagnosed with a um, progressive disease that we knew was going to kind of um, or was and did now rob him of his ability to walk. So myself as an individual started like I wasn't able to give my all to my clients anymore because they would come in sad about, you know, the furniture or the beach house. And I felt like I was dealing with this bigger issue in in my life. So I felt like I needed to take a step back um, and really uh, think about priorities and how people focus on what's important in their life. Mm -hmm. And I ended up leaving the practice because I wanted to be like a bigger force for good. And I thought divorce is so destructive and I have so much um, personal stress in my life that I need to be a force for good I, and um, the, so I switched completely. I went into teaching and now I am a, a coach and a teacher. So I um, ended up in this place feeling like now I'm going to make it a priority for um, myself to change, not change divorce from happening because it's going to happen, but try to preserve the idea of family, even if we're getting a divorce. You're still yeah in the end and it's it's totally possible because I've done it I've lived through right. it here we are all these years later and that's, that's like my it's a like mass chaos in my house all the time I'm 
But this is so great. Go. This is like the perfect like working mom scenario. It right? is. It totally is because I'm like I have nothing going on, and then and I didn't. But now someone is here for my son who has nothing to do with me, so they can go around the other door. I'm sitting in the dining room. So it's like, there's a commercial like this. It's like one of my commercials. It is. Woman, she's like a TV reporter. And then all these things are happening and she's, no, she was being interviewed on TV and all these things are happening around her. And she just keeps going with the, the it's so true. that's my day every day. I'm like, <laughs> it's the chaos in the background. I'm like whatever. I'm focusing on this now. And I'm so excited about it too, because I feel like you said, it's going to be a movement when people start thinking about divorce happens, it's a fact of life, but the family still exists. And that's where the process has failed society because yeah. the process doesn't care that you guys are going to be grandparents and at you know first birthday parties for grandchildren and graduations. Mm -hmm. If we change the conversation to one of acknowledging the sadness that comes and mourning that process, but then moving forward together to create something new, You're yeah, put the assets. But so, so it's so I lived through a brutal divorce. I was the child, the product of it. Right, my brother was as well, and I had really good self-preservation skills uh, that allowed me to keep moving forward but a lot of people don't so there's a lot of broken adults in our society right now based on these th this kind of scenario and broken marriages that didn't need just because the marriage ended to, didn't mean right. that it needed to be toxic so having lived through that i remember as a child how anxiety ridden i was how right. torn i felt i was and as an adult and having made that conscious decision, I would never ever do that to my children if the situation ever transpired. And and when I did it very intentionally uh, to not bring courts in because my dad was a divorce attorney, and right. you know, and I witnessed like sadly that's what made money. The longer it went on, and the more toxic it became, the more. Right, because we're making, and so I witnessed all this perpetuating that was happening, and just yeah, intuitively as a child, I knew it wasn't right. So when I had been making this decision uh, to be very conscious and to not, we we avoided courts on purpose, like literally right. did not go to attorneys and handled everything on our own, and and it doesn't just need again doesn't need to be around divorce. This this is all relationships. This isn't even just intimate it's relationships. True. Thing we're talking about is like even sibling issues, right? Like it's really about learning to check your ego at the door, right? Become more emotionally intelligent, and 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 know it doesn't have to be that way. And so I'm gonna give you, you know, a chance to tell your story. But I just want to say one thing real fast. Uh, when when my ex husband and I first got separated, divorced, and we still did things together, we'd still show up at sporting events together. Right. People would be like, that's so weird. And I'm like, no, it's weird that you think we should hate each other. Right. That's, that's exactly your that's exactly it. Like it should be weird that you think we should hate each other or that it's okay for you to, you know, try to take him for every dime or oh no, I lost whatever. her. Right. Exactly. <laughs> she was bringing the good part too. I love it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Shelly, I see you're here. I love that you're watching right now too. Yeah. Uh, I, it's and it's a comedy that hopefully she picks that up uh, quickly. This yeah, is her first time up. using this platform as well. She's uh, waiting. So hopefully she picks back up quickly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I so I love what she's doing and I'm so excited about this because it really does awaken to a new conversation. It made me so upset when um, Gwyneth Paltrow uh, was getting divorced and they said hugs and kisses to you too Shelly yeah. and they said that they were doing a conscious uncoupling and everyone in the media literally destroyed them made a joke out of it right like, what is this word and terminology and um and they should be a model and, I mean and the truth is that's the best thing to do this con conscious uncoupling is what Regina is talking right. about here and what her business is about because it's teaching people how to be conscious in 
you know, maybe separating ways. Again, it doesn't need to just be a marriage. It can be friendships. It can be, right. uh, you know, people within your family that you just don't see it eye, eye to eye on. There doesn't need to be hate. There doesn't need to be destruction. There doesn't need to be anger. People can literally just decide, like, we're not seeing eye to eye. And it doesn't mean you're right. It doesn't mean right. you're wrong. And I'm not wrong or right. We're just not seeing the same perspective. And it's more destructive for us to keep hanging out in the same space than it is for us to try to... Um, see eye to eye or be in the same page or share the same dreams and vision. So this is a powerful conversation that I believe is just getting started. I, as when Regina came to me with this idea, she was like, what do you think? And I'm like, I think it's amazing. Yeah. And, and I, I think that more people need this and want this. And I don't think that people want divorce or breakups to be so destructive. And no one's and I think talking that people about want, it. Uh, another way to do it. They just don't know how to do it differently. Right. And like I had mentioned, when I was first going through this process myself and people would see my ex and I together and they think it was weird. And I was like, this is so disruptive that people right. in our society think we're supposed to hate each other, that they think that we're supposed to be battling each other and fighting over what stuff, that, yes. fighting and over nothing, right? Yeah. Things that are yes. all replaceable. Right. And as and Regina had pointed out, as she was a divorce attorney and realizing when she had a sick son and all she wanted was for her son to be healthy and well and 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 people are coming fighting over couches and curtains and she was like what is happening here this is absolutely insane if i could give anything just for my son to be oh we got you back was I gone? I was gone all that time. I didn't, I got a text. I'm like, why am I getting a text in the middle of this? But, um, but you're right. But what you're talking about is the emotions and you as, you know, all this study and work you've done with emotional intelligence. I think if the system says to people, you need to lose your ego at the door and move forward thinking about empathy and compassion and even gratitude, that is not going to be easy for people in this situation. But I think if the conversation starts to change from one where we expect to de destruction to where we expect a transformation, just like families come in all shapes, sizes, forms in 2018. But for some reason, when people are getting divorced, it's that is the destruction of that family. Yeah. And I wish I had a visual aid because, um, the if you go back, why was divorce frowned upon? The, because the family is the building block of society. So mm -hmm. why does our divorce process like almost ensure its destruction instead of try to preserve what they can moving forward? And you take empathy, gratitude, and compassion, and like you said, it applies to all relationships. Then, yeah. So I want I want you to say what you just said to people so they can actually understand historically how this belief system really got started. How you just said, you know, it was frowned upon to get divorced and this was a religious right. belief, right? And and so societal norms, the government. Right, and the yeah. government and the church made it. And, you know, and it's we laugh about it, but it's true. Like people didn't live as long. So you could get, you know, divorce was going to be less common just on that basis anyway, but to be divorced even in this country up until the 1970s, you had to prove that somebody else had wronged you in some way. It was a fault-based system. Even now, when um, I was just helping a client yesterday and we were checking off the boxes on her divorce complaint and she was saying it's irretrievable breakdown. That means irreconcilable differences. And you still had to put a reason, you know, was, were you emotionally abandoned? Um, were you not financially supported? And it's just crazy in 2018 that you have to assign blame that way. When, mm -hmm. as you said, people can just decide that they're not their best versions of themselves when they're together. And right. And that's okay. Right. right. And, and then can be great friends and great parents just they understand to be their full self, they can't be married to that person anymore. Yeah. 
Agreed. Hey, Andrea. She's walking she's and walking us at the same time. I love it. That's what I do. I multitask. Multitasking like me. <laughs> Whenever I walk, I listen to something that's making me grow. I love it. So I want to talk about that for a second because I feel that as we become more emotionally intelligent, more self-aware people, as society continues to evolve, um, th this understanding of what relationships is, the belief systems around relationships are evolving as well, where we're talking about conscious uncoupling, but let's talk about just even conscious coupling to begin with. Right. When I was younger, it was like, you're hot, I'm hot, you like to work yeah. out, I like to work out. Okay. Right. <laughs> exactly. Right? And, and, and so there, there wasn't a true basis where now when I'm coaching my clients in you know, the being the best versions of themselves. And if they are in a relationship that's not fully fulfilling to them or they want a relationship and don't have one, what I'm asking them is like, what does that relationship in your ideal world look like? Right. And and don't give me superficial answers. Give me what does it feel like? How are they supporting you? What kind of right. conversations do you have? And so if we actually learn these things ahead of time, a lot right. of relationships wouldn't get to that point and and even when they got to a point so studying buddhism for for so many years buddhism has this non-attachment it's really kind of baffling if you think about it but this non-attachment belief system around relationships and it's kind of that metaphor if you pick a flower it dies if you observe it it blooms right and so relationships are more supposed to be the observer of flower blooming so two people coming together is really about growth Right. And sometimes you just grow in separate directions. And Especially when you get married young and you're barely a full human being yet, right? And yeah. you have to really, um, I think part of the way our system or society fails us also is by not preparing people who are getting married to say, you know, um, when your kids are between the ages of five and nine, it's going to be total chaos. And after that, it kind of gets worse because then they're in high school and you have to worry about where they are and you're driving, you know, three kids, six places and two hours. And my life right now. <laughs> right, exactly. And the stress that that causes, if people aren't being compassionate and empathetic for each other, you know, you know, maybe mom's running around like crazy and dad was exhausted at work that day, but mama also worked. They need to be willing to say, how are you, honey? Like, I know this is crazy, but we'll be all right. Yeah. And people withdraw and end up again, getting kind of in this cycle of blame. Like, why is why are things so disorganized? Why wasn't that done today? And then the resentment grows and that leads to the destruction of some of these relationships. Well, it, 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 it becomes so many of our relationship programming in our society is transactional. Like I did this, I need to do that. And that doesn't leave room from compassion because you're, you're tallying to, it's like, I did this. Now you do something of equal value, which is, and no one feels like they're winning when that right. happens. And also I want to give a shout out to Dr. Joe Schneider. He's here. And he said, this conversation needs to keep happening. So it becomes a norm. And, um, and then right. Shelly, I'm sorry. Shelly's here. I never get to see her anymore. Uh, <laughs> it's nice to but, meet you all. <laughs> but um, that's why I love live because you can like actually feel like everyone's part of your conversation. Right, with hanging you. out. And yeah. That's what it is. I think about this like, okay, so maybe I have a daunting task, right? I want to change the conversation so that it becomes the norm, but I feel like doing it kind of one family at a time, you know, that's how you change the world. You start small and if I can get the message out there a little bit that I I do think ultimately it needs to be a systemic, like going down to the way lawyers practice, you know, go into that law firm and say, I think I want a divorce. I know many lawyers who just hand the client a stack of interrogatories or questions that need to be asked to the other, um, but the other party, the other spouse, they start out all guns blazing for exactly the reason you said, the system, that's the way the system makes money and keeps the system moving, right? Yeah. I don't have any interest in saying, yeah. right. It's a business, people. And every, right. It's a business. I've fed into the business and the hatred. And my whole thing is anger is cancer. So right. you're, well, I don't want cancer, so I don't want to be angry at anybody. So I'm just going to- energy it takes to stay 
and not let that go. And um, I, I'm thinking about this bigger and thinking about it from a social standpoint. And you and I talked about this a little bit already, just the social, or the, the trauma that children carry forward um, into divorce or into their adult lives from all kinds of things. And if divorce is really as common as statistics say it is, why don't we have an obligation to fix it so that we're not traumatizing 50% of our children who come from, you know, from a union between a husband and a wife. So I feel like there's an obligation to address it that way. So I have this story that really was so vibrantly valuable to me. Uh, a few years ago, I was picking my daughters up uh, from one of their friend's house and they got in the car and I said, how was your time? And they said, mommy, all of our friends, their parents are starting to get divorced. And I said, you know, it happens, you know, sometimes, you know, people grow apart. Some people just weren't meant to be right to begin with and they didn't have the tools to work through their problems. And, but their experience was that we were already divorced, but their experience, what they were trying to say to me is we're seeing something different than what we know. Right. And so I said to them, yeah. well, how do you feel about it? And they said, well, it's really sad. Their their parents hate each other, or yeah. they never see their dad because the mom won't let them see their dad, or vice versa. Right. And and I said, well, I said that's that really breaks my it's heart. Heartbreaking, it's heartbreaking, yeah. Heartbreaking for the child. And and I said, you know, you have the best dad ever. Mm. And their little hearts just like beamed, like literally beamed with right. like pride and joy. And I thought to myself. If they're beaming with pride and joy right now, what happens when you say the opposite? What happens right. when you're saying the negative? And and I don't think a lot of people stop to think that. Maybe I realize it so much because I was the child of it. You I suffered through it, it, right? And so, uh, oh, I I don't think a lot of people do this intentionally. And I know this is part of your movement. Is is you don't believe that either, and you want just people to wake up and see like. There's another way. Right. There's another right. way. So I want to ask you a, a, a situational question. Okay. I know a lot of people might be thinking of friends or family that they want to, you know, contact you for. Right. Number one, before I ask you the situational question, one of the things you've said to me, we've talked a lot about, is your goal is actually to potentially, you know, divorce might happen, but right. But you want to try and get into that conversation before it's in eminent that it is happening and right. you can actually even help work it through with skills that someone didn't have kind of like a counselor but mediator at the same time exactly and that's what so if we can keep them out of the system and one of the um things that people don't realize and that i can be a, incredibly helpful with is that you don't ever have to be in the system essentially it's a paperwork process right I I wasn't yeah. with them. And people are like, what? I don't need a court order that says what my support's going to be every month. I'm like, no, you really don't. You don't need a custody order. You can um, choose to be cooperative and you make decisions for your family that's best. So I can um, help people and I provide um, all sorts of guidance and checklists and background about what the process would be if they wanted to go through the system um, and what to expect really, but giving them the questions, like think about the reality of your life and you know, what are your child's activities and what parent needs to be on board? Those kinds of things help you come to decisions about custody, you know, now, look at your actual financial assets and how much it actually costs for you to live where you live and decide what is fair, what can each party contribute. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing about that is that every state has online calculators as well. So you could get an estimate, like here's what I think about what I owe mm -hmm. um, and take it from there to reach a decision amicably or mutually. Mm -hmm. I will do like a traditional mediation for clients who need me to sit with them and help go through that process all three of us together. Yeah. So this is the situational situational question I wanted to ask you. Let's just say a uh, situation happens where you're mediating and then there's one party involved who's really rational. 
Right. Doesn't want hate, doesn't want volatility. And then the other one is all that they, that they, they are, their ego is tripping out of control. Right. How, how do you step in? Like, give us an experience of like what you would do in that moment to level the playing field at least a little bit and get the other person to become at least a little more rational because an attorney typically, not everyone, but right. attorneys typically would love that. They'd be like, yeah, this is great. Right. We're, we're done here and we're marching out, right? Yeah. It, so let's say they're fighting about, um, you know, usually if they're going to get like that, it's usually over a custody issue because that's where the most most emotion is involved. And um, as trained mediators, we take a step back for them and say, okay, you know, I hear there's a lot of conflict here, but I also hear that you guys agree on how passionate you are about your children, right? And we don't want to subject your children to this anger, but all that love that each of you feel for them, to figure out a way to make sure they're surrounded by that all the time. Um, so if you hit them with a positive and, and an attribute that each has to admit they admire about the other one, right? You can't say like, she's a pain because she loves the kids too much, you know? Right. Um, right. It helps back things down a little bit so you can kind of move forward in a more um, productive way. So that's usually focusing on the positive or finding one thing that they can be grateful for um, in the other is a great way to stop the train. Do you sometimes have, like as a coach, I know as a coach, I don't know if I could hold back to not do this uh do you find yourself sometimes focusing on that one person that's not being rational or emotionally intelligent and kind of coaching them in that moment of here's everything that could go wrong with this behavior and here right. how much better everything could go with a different behavior yeah and sometimes it takes having to say to somebody you know think about all the energy you're spending right now and how you're feeling and it could really hopefully turn them around to be like, you know what? I have a better use for my time and energy and focusing on my children in a positive way is the best use of my time and energy. And making them feel loved and safe. And make, and, right. And not like they're going to have to choose holiday, and, choose one over the other, because I feel right. like that's what creates so much anxiety in children's lives and parents aren't getting it. Like all they're worrying about when they're getting into this cycle is I want to hurt that other person. And and the thing is, you're hurting the other person is hurting the person your kids also love the most. Right. right. Crazy. When you really break it down that way. And and I'll right. think, like your your exes or future exes, well-being is so much of a priority to the well-being of your child. So why right. do you want to dominate yeah. that person? And that's the part too. I think you and I talked about this too. Like, so your ex gets involved with somebody else. You need to be happy and hope that person's fabulous. And that person actually becomes an ally to you in your parenting if you do it with emotional intelligence. And I've said that to um, both, you know, uh, coaching clients and divorce clients, since sometimes having a, a step parent in the picture or a significant other, that is just another person that loves your child, right? And if you look at it that way, as opposed to I'm the mom and you know she's stepping on my toes. No, look at her as an ally. We're all worked, you know, crazy running around moms. And right. sometimes it's nice to have an ally in your corner, you know, and everyone is going to, and this is where it's hard, um, have horror stories, right? Mm -hmm. If we start at the beginning and start changing the conversation so that it's not socially acceptable to hate all of the parties involved, mm -hmm. in, you know, on both sides of the soccer field. Yeah. I think eventually those horror stories um, will, will lessen with yeah. time. And so this is a trauma, the adult trauma. I mean, there's a lot of adults that I work with uh, that are in their 40s that want relationships, they really truly want healthy relationships, but they are still stuck in the cycle of being the product of divorce. Right. And their belief systems and fears around relationships are so 
traumatizing and deeply ingrained in them that right. here they are 40 some year old adults and this could be 50 68 too i'm just using like a, a generalization right. of my population of clients who still have all these fears anxieties and beliefs stemming from that childhood because it wasn't handled as appropriately or as lovingly right. as possible there's this movie i love uh called Four Christmases with Vince Vaughn that I think is hilarious. <laughs> I, know. I know, she's got all these step pairs of different houses they have to go to. Yes, and I love it though because everyone's kind of just getting along and to me I was like, that's like a dream come true and right. everyone just get along and you know, be happy and my daughter's birthday was a few weeks ago and my boyfriend and my ex-husband are standing at a bar having a drink together and I'm right. like, yes, this is and awesome. Like, how comforting or like how enveloped in love that makes your kids feel and they can look at the room and see everybody there and i tell clients too I'm like look you don't actually have to love the other person you just have to um behave in a way that makes your kids feel safe essentially and they don't know the under the backstory and they shouldn't um but if they can look at you know ex-husband and boyfriend having a drink, all they feel is peace and contentment and surrounded by love. Yeah, it, it feels good for them and uh, makes them feel safe. By the way, Grelby's here. I saw that. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> Thank you, and Rose is here and Matt's here too. I know Matt, Matt has just been speaking at schools. Um, I saw his book, I think yesterday or today, so some kids. So Matt is helping heal what he does and coaching is helping heal ones that are going through stuff uh, that maybe don't have access to the Regina's of the world or have never had suggestion about doing something differently. So um, just give us an example of how you work with somebody very differently. You know, you were a divorce attorney, right? So have all your legal knowledge, which is right. Awesome, but you're how you're dealing with people and change the game by calling yourself a divorce coach over a divorce right. attorney. It really is. I'm calling myself a coach rather than an attorney because I'm hoping to help people like almost like a shepherd. I'm shepherding them through through a really difficult time without throwing them into a system that's going to force them to be adversaries or enemies. So yeah. I can um, basically literally coach clients. We'll sit down on a, on a call or with, uh, you know, over a cup of coffee and I'll say, okay, here's what you're afraid of. Here's the issue that's scaring you the most. And we brainstorm how to approach it. What does she need to get from her husband or what does the husband need to feel secure to move forward? And we brainstorm that conversation, almost kind of role play or anticipate what the arguments are going to be, give them the tools to have those conversations together. And then once they um, come come back, did I lose you? I can see. Once they um, come back, I'm going to refresh you. Oh, I lost her again. Oh, no. Uh, we'll have to wait for her to come back because Monica, oh. Okay, cool. I, I could tell I lost you for a second, but, um, but so I give them, I literally coach them um, with the conversation techniques and the topics that they need to have with their um, spouse to have a productive conversation. Um, and then we'll meet again and we'll go through it very methodically because the one thing about divorce, amicable or not, is that it's terrifying and overwhelming. And so you do need to have someone literally coaching you to like take a breath and we're going to deal with what's most important right now. And then we'll go through and um, deal with the next thing. Once you have security and you feel some peace that we can move forward. So you're, you're essentially doing emotional intelligence, focused emotional intelligence training, right? Situational emotional intelligence right. training to your clients really is right. what you're doing. Uh, which is amazing. Uh, Monica had a question that is a very good question. It's a very common one is, what do you say when your ex has moved on with someone else and she is totally misinformed of what he put you through? So maybe manipulating previous stories. Right. And she's taking jabs at you on social media. How do you handle that in an emotionally intelligent way that's still keeping 
amicability. I, I'm just assuming maybe, Monica, that there might be kids in the equation. Right. Or, or, or else you wouldn't still be connected. Right. I think the part, hardest part about that is, as they say, um, <laughs> is rising above over and over and over again. And I know how hard that is to do, but if you continue to take the high road, what I've found in uh, my own life personally and as well as with my clients, you can see what's being said on social media. And if what's being said on social media doesn't match at all with the um, picture that people are seeing when you're out and about and at the soccer games, like, I pretend that I don't don't see those jabs like they didn't happen. And I would walk right over to the at the soccer game and say, hey, how are you guys? And chat away and being the normal vivacious person that I'm sure you are. And people would think, huh, like that doesn't make any sense. So you chop it off at the knees. Like there's no credibility to what people are seeing on social media and you don't have to get involved with the jabbing and respond. You just be you and the answers are obvious to people. Um, so you don't, she has an eight, she has an eight, nine year old. Um, and so I guess that, uh, you know, for me, my mind would assume that what Monica's really trying to say is, I don't want to be bad mouthed right. in front of my children. And and that's a really serious conversation. Uh, and right. it's, it's a serious it's conversation. Like, be bad, like if that's, that's different than posting something about you on social media at that mm -hmm. point, right? So that, that really is a conversation where I would want, like the lawyer in me would want to come out a little bit and find out when and where that's happening. And if the significant um, other of your ex actually lives in the house with the children, um, then there are agreements that can be made. And I've done this fairly commonly where, especially with children of that age, um, the ex agrees that for right now, unless we're actually engaged to the significant other or they're actually living with that person, he spends his time with the children without her. So it's just one-on-one -on -one quality dad time. And um, hopefully then the children are getting the best of him and it lessens an opportunity for maybe a toxic third party to bad mouth mom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hope that makes sense and is responsive to what she's asking. Well, and I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier about getting parents to understand if you're talking badly about the other parent, right? it is so hurtful. If my children beamed when I said, you have the best dad ever, the opposite is true if you're bashing right. them. And so you might as well just take like hot water and throw it on your child. Right. And, and, and yeah, when you think about in that spirit that way, that's exactly right. Yeah. And that's the piece where the system you know, in the actual practice of law, you might go into court and complain that she's bad mouthing me to the other child or, you know, to the children. And the court is going to literally just like point their finger and say, don't do that. Nobody there giving the clients the emotionally intelligent tools. There, no, there's nobody saying you need to understand the bigger picture, what you're actually doing to the children. And if people had that information, maybe they would be less willing to do that, right? When they understand they're actively hurting their child. Yeah, so I can imagine there's a lot of people that will want to consult with you. Uh, so you do, you know, an open consulting for, you know, I don't know how many minutes, 15, 20 minutes, get somebody's story, right. so something you can navigate through, and then you kind of cope, that you come up with a coaching arrangement which right. is way cheaper, by the way, way cheaper. Way crazy, less cheap. Yeah, crazy cheaper right now. She's an attorney, but she is an attorney, just not right. putting her attorney hat on. She's putting her emotionally intelligent. Well, you're putting your, you're not leading with your attorney hat. You're right. coaching emotional intelligence hat. And that's why I think it's so valuable too, because like you said, I don't turn my brain off. So I can still tell people, you know, if this doesn't work out and you need to file something with the court, here's what you can expect. And so there's a, there's an emotionally intelligent piece of that too. You have to prepare yourself mentally and emotionally. You have to be prepared for acceptance because you might not get a result that you like at all. Um, but I can at least 
fairly accurately and very accurately in the state of Pennsylvania tell you what to expect from the system. Um, so it is kind of the best of two worlds. And when the coaching piece of it works, you save thousands and thousands of dollars as opposed to paying the lawyers. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so Monica, um, you know, kind of just addressed too that she feels really hurt. And that's where, yeah. that's where a lot of the volatility happens because people do get hurt. Right. Maybe one person's not ready to move on and let go and, and vice versa. And, and so when we can acknowledge that, you, that was so honest and transparent and vulnerable, Monica, right. so I applaud you for that. Because um, once we can acknowledge I'm hurt or I'm feeling these emotions, we can separate how we're feeling versus what needs to really right. happen. Um, and so, so tell me, um, so I was mentioning people, you know, are going to come to you and get a consult, um, consult with you and then, you know, work with you and they're saving thousands of dollars, still getting attorney advice, but with a very emotionally intelligent twist to it. Um, just give us a little backstory on your company you know really i love the name of it and why and the tagline of it i love right. which we worked on recently um just so people understand your whole mission and message so the message the, the tagline is um you know changing society one family at a, at a time changing society's beliefs about divorce one family at a time and i really started it um and well the way I got even the idea to do this as a business was because I found myself doing it many hours a month just to my friends and people in my community who knew I was a divorce attorney and liked my positive attitude and were asking me, you know, I was going through um, my own pretty contentious divorce um, because I had, a, you know, I have a spouse who was, is really hurt. And so part of being able to be positive and overcome is just the empathetic piece of it is putting yourself in their shoes and like kind of forgiving what you would never expect yourself to forgive because you can recognize that they're hurt and that eases the process a little bit. Um, but I was doing it all the time and people were so grateful. And I realized that I was really actually helping the, my community a lot. And I thought I'm going to do this on a bigger scale and try. And I got out of the, practice of divorce because it was toxic, but maybe I can do this and still help people in a way that's positive while hopefully changing this conversation. Yeah. Um, so how do people get in touch with you? And, and I'll put this into the comment feed um, as well, but you know, how do people get in touch with you? And I want people to understand that you are, this is a mission for you. This isn't just, um, you know, something that you're spending your time doing. This right. is that you really truly want to change the world with. So uh, not just people who want to get in touch with you to you know go through the process with you, but I'm sure there's also going to be people that want to get in touch with you to align with you, with their businesses. Like Matt, Matt right. is a good alliance to me because he's working with um, you know people healing and he's speaking to children who maybe be going through something like this. So right. there's also people that I think would be great resources business-wise um, so what's the best way to get in touch with you? And are you open to all of that as well? Absolutely. I would love to, because I think so much, especially in the wellness community and um, so much of the idea of healing and emotional intelligence is mainstream and they just haven't dropped the piece of divorce into it. You know, and children go through so much significant trauma with the loss of a parent or addiction of a parent. Um, and, the divorce piece doesn't get talked about that much and why it's how we can lessen that trauma on them. So I'd love it for people to reach out. I have a Facebook page, which is um, Family Transitions, Divorce Coaching and Mediation. And I have a website, which is ftdivorcecoaching.com. Um, and I, I can reach me on my cell phone too. And I should give you the shout the number out there is 302-438-7734. That is also on my uh, Facebook page and website as well. So you, you have some videos to post on YouTube that might be helpful for people, right? I have a couple videos on YouTube. I posted another one to um, Facebook last night that I haven't put on my YouTube channel yet. It's um, Regina DeAngelis is um, my YouTube channel, which 
is fun. It's, it's fun to have a YouTube channel. <laughs> oh, and just so you all know too, right now, Regina is also a teacher, a school yes. teacher. She transitioned out of law uh, for a bit and found herself teaching because she loves teaching and right. flexibility as a, uh, a mom, single mom now with a uh, son with extra needs. And, and so now here she's like starting this business because she couldn't let it go. And it was right. so important to her. But you know, and the teaching made sense when I was interviewing to be a teacher. I love it, but people were saying, why'd you switch? And it really is because I want wanted to be a force for good or surround myself with positive energy and nothing's better than young people at the front of that. And then I couldn't let, you know, after my personal experience and being part of the system, there's just still a bigger message. Teaching, um, you know, high schoolers about world history, which though, <laughs> the pieces of the church and society and divorce and why it's such a problem, all together so nicely, um, but it's kind of that made the light bulb go off. Like, oh my gosh, now I know why this paradigm is so ingrained. It goes back, you know, a thousand years, um, and so it made all the pieces fall together. Good. Well, listen, I love what you're doing. I am a huge supporter. I know so many people who need this, want this, it never ex really existed as an opportunity before. And now it does because we are becoming a more conscious society. And right. consciousness, we want to change things that are broken. And I applaud you and I'm so proud of you. And so I shared you with everybody because this can't be a secret. This is yeah. to be known. So I think that's so much. This is so fun. Well, this is just the beginning of all your TV interviews. Right. You know. I, I could talk for like I, <laughs> I need a very big platform. <laughs> well, the world wants you to have one. So so okay. grateful to have you. Thank you all Thank for being a part of this, your questions, your comments. Thank and so glad it made a positive impact for you all. Yep. Thank you so much, Jen. Absolutely. <laughs> all right, bye. Bye. bye.